Deliverance is dangerous. Beware. Deliverance is dangerous. At the beginning of the church, I'm a student of church history, and in our International School of Exorcism, online educational institution of exorcism and deliverance, I have any students or graduates of my school out there? A few of you? Wonderful. I saw you nodding in your head, sir. You know what I'm talking about. We teach people a deep understanding of church history because I think it's so important to see movements like this are rooted in what happened 18, 1900 years ago. That what you do was normal then. What you do was normal in the life of Christ. It was normal in the apostolic age. It was normal in the early church. Most people do not understand that. They think that somehow we went from the apostolic age to nothing in terms of healing and deliverance. But also you need to know that at the beginning were the roots of what you do were established. It was dangerous to be a Christian. One of the most dangerous statements ever uttered in the history of mankind was the words of Jesus in Matthew 4, 19. Follow me. Follow me. This ragtag group of tax collectors and fishermen, etc., had no idea what they were in for. What did that mean? Follow me. It meant they would hear a radical message that had never before been preached in human history. It meant they would see Jesus walk on water, blind eyes see, lame heal, people raised from the dead, and the gospel would be preached to the poor. But it also meant that eventually, eventually, 10 of the original disciples would pay for it with their lives. Only one of them lived to a ripe old age. They think John lived to about 98, and the other one killed himself. But the other 10, who responded to the message, follow me, paid for it with their lives. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was pierced by a spear. Philip was impaled with hooks and hung upside down. Matthew was stabbed to death. Bartholomew, we sometimes call him Nathaniel, was flayed and beheaded. James, the son of Zebedee, was stoned. James, the son of Alphaeus, was stoned. Simon the Zealot was crucified upside down. Thaddeus Jude was executed with an axe. Matthias, chosen after Jesus was saying, was burned alive. Well, so much for the prosperity gospel and the idea that Christians should always be healthy and wealthy. <laughs> I think that most of you believe we're at the end of time. But these indeed are the last days. I've heard that my whole life. And as you know, the pastor let you know I have been around for a while. Thank you, pastor. <laughs> I've heard it my whole life. And I don't have time to get into why I believe that now we've taken an exponential leap forward just in the last couple of years to the fulfillment of that time. In the first century, to be a Christian meant to be persecuted. If we've forgotten the words of Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 35, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. 
Still others had trial of mockings, of scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sodden too, they were tempted, they were slain by the sword, they wandered in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Oh, and they wandered in desert mountains, dens, and caves of the earth. That's not a way to gain converts, is it? That's not the way to get people involved in deliverance, is it? Let's be realistic. Deliverance is dangerous. To be sold out to Jesus Christ is dangerous. You can live a very comfortable Christian life in America today. And you can be told every single Sunday what a wonderful life it is to serve Jesus and how happy, wealthy, and healthy you're going to be as a result of it. But those folks don't do deliverance. They don't get spit on, pu puked on. I one time had a, a football player collegiate level, all muscle, sitting across from me. And sometimes when I do deliverance with people, as those of you who have been with me know, I get up real close and personal. <laughs> and I should have known better. <laughs> the next thing I know, he had knocked me unconscious. And I'm laying on the ground, coming back to, having seen stars. To this day, I have a deviated septum because of what he did. Remember one time in South Africa, I was driving an automobile, and the brakes went out. Just totally disappeared. And this was a brand new Jaguar that had been loaned to me by another individual, and I, I barely made it to the side of the road. And, and shortly thereafter, I got a phone call from someone I had been ministering to in America, one of the most serious cases of satanic abuse that I've ever dealt with. And this individual said, did your car almost crash? I said, why are you asking? I hadn't said a thing to this individual. The person said, because the demons tampered with your brakes. And you're supposed to be dead right now when I'm calling to see if you're alive. I've had my ribs broken. I've had a knife up my throat. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was involved in what could have been a fatal accident, or at least one, a very serious injury. I was just less than a mile from my office, getting off the freeway. I just made a turn. I was going down the road. Suddenly, the crunch of metal, airbags exploding. I flew across two lanes of traffic. Smell of smoke and fire coming out from under the hood. I, I regained my senses and said, Lord, I'm in a car wreck. I never saw what hit me. Young woman, I don't know if she was texting or whatever, she made an illegal U-turn. Smashed into me at a high speed. I got out of the car, staggered. That was a little, <laughs> a little bit shaky. I called my house, uh, my middle daughter jumped in the car, drove just a few miles there to be with me, and she's the one who's gonna be the lawyer, said, Dad, I got this, take care of it. Sit in the car, I'll handle the whole thing. And she did, she did a great job. While I'm sitting there in a daze, a man walks up to me. I did not know what happened. And he says, excuse me, sir, but I was waiting at the intersection and I saw this car make an illegal U-turn at high speed and jam into you. The driver was saying, what did you do? Why did you hit me? Why did this accident happen? The guy said, ma'am, you hit him making it a legal turn. Oh, really? God even had a witness. I did spend five hours in the ER making sure I got my brain scanned. Everything seems to be all right. <laughs> Maybe it was just an accident. Okay, things happen. Not every car accident is the devil. I don't even know if it was the devil. 
I just know that it was an extreme close call, and the day before, I spent the entire day ministering to a Haitian woman bound by some of the most powerful voodoo demons on the planet. Okay. Maybe this is just life. Maybe it's not. But I'm not here to warn you about physically life-threatening situations. The danger of deliverance may not be what you think. I'm not referring to the challenges to your physical well-being, like being assaulted by a demon-possessed person. Let me tell you what the danger is. Of getting involved in this kind of ministry and being misunderstood by those who pose this idea. So let me tell you what some of the dangers are that you might face. Deliverance is dangerous to your spiritual apathy. When you embrace all the deliverance stands for, you're going to bring a radical change in how you see God and how the Christian life is to be lived. Deliverance is dangerous to your complacency to avoid claiming the promises of God. What would happen? To your demons of defeat, failure, poverty, and disease, if you really started living in freedom financially, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and following the path that this pastor and church has set for you, that's dangerous to think about. Come on. Deliverance is dangerous to your apathetic, underachieving, boring Christian life. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. It's a dangerous idea to walk in God's anointing and destiny. It's dangerous to your lowered expectations of what the rest of the world in American Christianity thinks being a Christian is all about. It's dangerous. You know, some people can't handle being delivered. As I often say, they've made friends with their demons. They don't know how to live without their anger. They don't know how to live without their rejection. They don't know how to live without their depression and negativity. I know this pastor understands what I'm talking about. They are so bound to their demons and have lived that way for so long, that is what's most comfortable to them. And to tell them it can be different is dangerous. There's some of you here this morning. You made friends with your depression. Everybody feels sorry for you. Oh, he's really depressed today, isn't he? Now, I'm not saying there aren't issues of biochemical depression. Of course, I know that. But for some of you, your depression is demonically driven. And, and you've been depressed for so long, you don't know how to not be depressed. And you've kind of gotten used to it and made friends with it. And then here's your anger. You've learned to make friends with your anger. Because you can control and manipulate people with it. Jezebel loves that. People are so afraid of when you're going to go off at them. Oh, when's it going to blow next? Everybody, as we say, walks in pins and needles around you. And you like that. You feed on that. You don't know what it's like to be free, and some of you don't want to know what it's like to be free. It's dangerous to think about not being bound to your afflictions and your negative emotions and having everybody cater to you rather than you standing up on your own in Christ and claiming his promises and walking in freedom to set an example of what being a Christian is all about. Not only is it dangerous to your underachieving Christianity and spiritual apathy, but deliverance is dangerous to your theological beliefs. You're going to have to walk against the grain and swim upstream against the inbred ideology of American Christianity. Do you know that you bunch of weirdos? You don't fit in. You don't fit. Not with American Christianity. 
Didn't anybody ever tell you Christians can't have generational bloodline curses? Didn't they tell you that? Some of you came to churches from churches where they told you that, and that's why you're here. Because you found out it's real, and you got delivered from it, and you don't want to go back there and be in that bondage. Amen? It's dangerous. Because you're going to have to embrace the idea that Christians can be bound by demons. They can have demons. Whatever word you want to call it. I just like the word possessed. I know some preachers don't like that because they think it connotes the bad wrong. The, no, 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 no. Demonized. Okay, demonized. But possession is such a strong word. Okay. Because most of my life has not been spent in the church. Most of my ministry has been spent in the secular world. With Dr. Phil and with Oprah and with Larry King and, oh, you know, CNN and NBC, MSNBC and, you know, Fox and whatever. I've, I've done them all. I've done more network secular television shows than any living Christian. Okay? So those people aren't caught up in all of that. If I talk to them about deliverance, they think it's a bunch of guys who are serial killers playing banjos back in the woods somewhere. You guys don't remember the movie, do you? So I, I like the word exorcism, and I like the word possession. I just like it. It's powerful. It's strong. It kicks devil butt. Exorcism. <laughs> possession. <laughs> now, you can split hairs theologically. You can... Quote the Greek. But you see, in the world that I minister to, and the crazy people who watch me on YouTube, I don't have a Christian audience. I, I've got some really strange people out there. <laughs> so they understand exorcism. They understand possession. So that's why I use that. But here's my point. The idea that a Christian can in some way have a demon, you're going to have to give up. Yeah. It's dangerous to believe that. Because some of your Christian friends won't have anything to do with you anymore because they think you're a nutcase now. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Christians can't have demons. They said so on TVN, and that makes it a fact. Benny Hinn said it. That makes it a fact. I'm not knocking Benny. But he doesn't believe Christians can have demons. He just picked on Benny. His name happened to come to my mind. Sorry, Benny, but it was the Holy Spirit. I downloaded it. I had to say it. Okay. You know one of the nice things about getting old? All your enemies are dead, and you don't care what anybody thinks about you anymore. <laughs> Thirdly, now we're going to get... I haven't been terribly controversial so far. So we're going to veer into a little bit of a controversial, comfort, controversial area. Who delivers dangerous to your theological beliefs and it's also dangerous to your political beliefs. <laughs> you know, that's how Joe says that. What he does, he leans into the microphone, he says, I want to say this about COVID. <laughs> and he's just one year older than me. I think Jesus makes a difference, don't you? Amen. Huh? I wouldn't be who I am doing what I do without the supercharge of the Holy Ghost flowing through me. Come on. It's dangerous because when you deal with demons, boy, I could just I could spend a couple more hours on this. When you deal with demons, you're in another world. You're in another spiritual reality, and you see things the way they are. People who believe in deliverance, they are not victimized by woke culture. They know a lie when they see it. We live in an age where truth is turned upside down. 
Meekness has become capitulation. Social media groupthink determines how people live. And with COVID's come a new kind of mind control. The enforced sacrifice of individuality. How many of you know who Dinesh D'Souza is? He's the guy that did the Hillary films that nobody wanted to see, you know. The guy the government sent to prison on a trumped up political charge and eventually got out. Strong, powerful, Christian, conservative voice in America. I had breakfast with him just a couple of weeks ago. And boy, did we have a lot to talk about. He's a great guy. And he's got some more films coming out. And he made a statement to me. I was asking him, you know, how is it that these political idiots get by with what they get by with? No names, just, you know who the idiots are out there. <laughs> how do they get by with what they get by with? And he said, Bob, in politics, the bigger the lie, the more likely it is to be believed. That's the principle they operate on. I thought that was incredible insight. You get that? In public. Some of the stupid stuff they say, and people in group think lockstep with it. The bigger the lie, the more likely people will believe it. Let me, let me try this on for you. Abortion is a medical right. Oh, so I signed in front of the Supreme Court a couple of days ago. Abortion is health care. What? It's murder. It's murder. Well, how do I know that? I'll tell you how I know abortion is murder. Anybody in deliverance knows abortion is murder because you over and over again encounter spirits of murder and death. And when you ask those demons of murder and death how they got there, they always sneer and say, because she had an abortion. Now, if the demons know that abortion is not health care but murder, why can't these blank, 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 blank in Washington figure that out? Because they have demons. The Taliban had us for lunch, and we tip them with $80 billion of our finest fighting machines and left it behind. And the Pentagon walks away from that, leaving our friends to be slaughtered because we really trust the Taliban to do the right thing. And then focus their attention on gender diversity. Come on. Now, what am I saying to you? I'm not preaching politics here. I'm saying. Actually, I'm saying I don't know of a single deliverance minister who voted for Joe Biden, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> are, you, are, are you still on YouTube out there? Are you still streaming? <laughs> That was a joke. <laughs> My point is this. Deliverance, hear me, touches every area of your life. When you start to embrace this idea of people really being free in Christ, it changes the way you think about everything. If you aren't married, it's going to change who you're going to marry. You get delivered, you might not want to marry Jezebel. 
I'm talking about you women and the man. Men have Jezebel too. Okay. And maybe most important, deliverance is dangerous to how you see Satan and the supernatural. Oh, boy. Time's running out. If you believe in deliverance, it's dangerous. You cannot do yoga anymore. Oh. How? 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 Without, without reflexology and Qigong and Tai Chi and Reiki, how are you going to survive without your energies being properly redistributed? <laughs> how are you going to live without your enneagram and your astrology horoscope if you get delivered? Do you see, it's going to change your whole world. You're not even going to be able to cast the spell against that ex-lover who dumped you. What are you going to do? You're not going to be able to sit in a lotus position and, and find God. You won't be able to get what you want by the law of attraction. Oh, I could go on and on and on. You won't have any of those things anymore to prop up your life. All you'll have is... Jesus. God's calling you to a life of danger, a life on the edge, a life of excitement and challenge. It's dangerous. It was dangerous for John the Baptist. Lost his head. Jesus said of him in Luke 7, 28, I say unto you, among those born of women, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. What are you aspiring for? Hmm? Come on, what are you really after? The approbation of people? The acceptance by other Christians? Or to be known as someone unique in the eyes of Jesus? It was dangerous to be Mary Magdalene. It's pretty dangerous when you got seven demons. Most people don't know that's a small amount. I often cast out a lot more than that out of one person. You people know what I'm talking about. It's dangerous to have seven demons. She got delivered, and John 20 tells us, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away. It was dangerous to be demonized, but she got delivered, and she was the first person to see Jesus alive. Amen. Come on, amen? It's dangerous. Ask Stephen. He was stoned to death. But hear these words of Acts 7.55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing to the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing to the right hand of God. Now, you do not want to get me started on the whole open heavens thing, and all these people are going up to have a chit-chat and a friendly little talk with Jesus, Peter, Paul, James, and the rest of them. Just don't ask me to go there. Because I'm going to tell you the people who do that, for the most part, they don't do deliverance. They're picking on other supernatural, strange fire. Maybe not 100%. You, you didn't ask me here to be nice, okay? You didn't ask me here to say pleasant, comfortable things. Well, actually, you didn't even ask me here at all. He did, and you could blame him, but that's... <laughs> he saw Jesus. And Jesus, I'm sorry, some of these stories out there, Jesus just not come to sit on the foot of your bed and have a chat with you some evening. No, no, no. He saw Jesus. It was real. It's recorded in the holy word of God. It was not some man's 
idea of what happened and a sleepless night with too much pizza, he saw Jesus as he was dying. You get it? He's dying. The stones are falling. And he sees Jesus. So I'm calling you to a dangerous life. But you know, I don't know too many of you people out there who are half my age who could keep up with me for one day. Ask my wife. Ask the people who know me. I have absolutely perfect health. I have more energy and I'm probably older almost than anybody in this room. And you couldn't survive a week with me. There isn't enough Red Bull on the planet to keep you going. <laughs> and you know why? Jesus. Because I'm involved in a ministry that constantly challenges my mind, challenges my soul, challenges my spirit. I'm involved in a ministry that brings me to tears day after day as I hear the gut-wrenching stories of what people have been through and what the devil has done to them. I like this precious young lady, I may be here this morning somewhere, I can't see because of the lights that I ministered to you yesterday. After two hours of prayer ministry with her, she got up and gave me one of the tightest hugs I've ever had in my life. You can't, you can't trade a hug like that from somebody who's being set free by Jesus compared to anything else. It will pour vitality and strength and energy into your being that is supernatural from God. And that's why. That's why the devil hates deliverance. And that's why Satan's going to come against you in this church in ways you can't even imagine. And you can't even really prepare for it except spiritually. But God will see you through it. God has seen me through it. I've cast out more demons than any other living person on earth. And deliverance, if it's such a bad thing, and it's such a terrible thing, and if it's such a thing to be avoided, why am I doing so great? I've got a wonderful wife, a great family, incredible friends. If it's so bad, why am I doing so well? And I'm not crediting me. Yes, I'm gutsy and I'm determined. And I study very hard to do what I do, and I never give up. That's what my soul does. But what my spirit does in Jesus because of the calling of deliverance, I want to tell you, if you want real success in life, where it really matters, with your family, with your friends, with the people who really know you, answer the call to minister healing and deliverance to people. I call you to a dangerous life. A life of liberation and unlimited possibilities. Living on the edge of the next greatest miracle. I come home from work at nights and I sit down with my wife. How many sessions did you do today? Eight. I haven't even talked to you about the virtual encounters that we do, but I do them all day long. Sean, oh man, it was just one more during that day, but what a miracle. And sometimes I say to my wife, you're not gonna believe what I'm gonna tell you. You will not believe what happened today. I learned so much today about spiritual warfare in the realm of the supernatural. She says, you, you learn something today? Every day. Forget shuffleboard and crossword puzzles. If you want to stay young, do deliverance. Yeah. 
leave behind a life of languor and malaise and frustration and tediousness and monotony and humdrum routines. Embrace a way of life. Constantly breaking free of bondages of your ancestors, your predecessors, and your detractors. I think I should say that again. Embrace a life of constantly breaking free from the bondage of your ancestors, your predecessors, and your detractors. You people here. I am so excited for you. Where you're going to go and what you're going to do. Some of you will fall by the way. You can't handle it. But from the sound of the applause, I don't think that's very many. Most of you are going to make it to the mountain. And you're going to come down the other side. Okay? Stay the course. Stay the course. Stay on target. Don't ever give up. So much I want to say, but let me, let me just add this, because so many times, Idra's been with me, Susan, Tony, they've been with me. Well, I've been pounding away at a case, maybe for an hour or two, and it's going nowhere, right? Nothing's happening. Nothing's manifesting. And then all of a sudden, right? How many times have you seen that happen with me? I get a discerning word from the Lord or something shifts and boom, all hell breaks loose. If I'd quit five minutes earlier, if I'd quit 60 seconds earlier, that wouldn't have happened. Now, there are times, I will, wish I had to, time to teach you on this, but there are times to take a time out and stop. Sometimes I get into deliverance and I just know this is not going anywhere. I have to stop. But that's rare. Most of the time, the devil depends on the lack of perseverance of God's people, our lack of determination, our willingness to be worn out, exhausted, ready to give up, and giving up. If you think this is all talk, you ask these people who know me best and who have been by my side. And it's how I got to be. So full of fire and enthusiasm for you at this point in my life. So, it's dangerous. Won't always go the way you want it to go, and some stuff will happen along the way. But if you persevere, you're faithful. Incredible things are waiting on the other side. And let me tell you this. What's most important is not the success you'll have at deliverance, but the sexual success you'll have with marriage, family, friends, the things that count most in life. My real prize isn't any accolade I've ever received of any kind here. It's a loving wife I pray with every day. Three beautiful daughters who love Jesus with all their hearts. Who are on their own way to greatness. You think that just happens? Hmm. No. I believe God has honored me for my faithfulness, and he will honor you for your faithfulness. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be a lot of trials and some heartbreak along the way and some sleepless nights. And Hey, I'm the bionic man. I've had more surgeries on me than anybody in this audience to keep going. Okay, I believe in doctors, and once in a while you need them to patch them up. And I came home from climbing Count Mill climbing Count Mill and Kilimanjaro in Africa, one of the tallest mountains in the world, and I had to have my knees replaced. But I made it to the top. <laughs> so 
thank you, Pastor, for having me.